Hello everyone, and welcome to the last lecture series tonight. My name is Holly Sims, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a co-chair of Housing Residence Life. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's edition of the last lecture series. The last lecture series is a 30-year tradition at UVA that asks some of our most engaging and influential professors the question, what if this was the last lecture you could ever give? The idea was popularized by former UVA and Carnegie Mellon professor, Carnegie Mellon University professor, Randy Posh, who was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2006. The hope is that over the course of the week, our three renowned speakers will reflect on the wisdom they would wish to impart if this was their last chance to do so. Tonight, it is my honor to introduce our last lecture series speaker, Professor Mamadou Dia. Professor Dia is a professor, professor of French and Media Studies here at UVA. Formerly a video journalist in Senegal, Professor Dia moved to the U.S. to complete his MFA in Writing and Directing at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. After completing his MFA, Professor Dia co-founded the production company Joya Didi to produce films that tell the stories of everyday people who are the heroes of their own lives. In 2021, Professor Dia's film Nafi's Father was nominated for an Oscar in the Best International Film category. Other work of Professor Diaz has been screened at film festivals in Toronto, Chicago, Venice, and New York City because of its exploration of the fine balance between fiction and fact, narrative, and documentary. Just this month, Professor Diaz was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship, which he will use to support a new feature-length film based on the life of a 19th century African-American photographer, Augustus Washington. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we are deeply excited to see what he will share with the world in the future and with us tonight. Without further ado, uh, without further ado, here is our last lecture speaker series, series speaker, Professor Mamadou Dia. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here tonight. It's always a pleasure to speak at UVA. I remember that I did my uh, job talk actually in this room. So this is a room that brings bad memories. <laughs> so, I'm Mamadou Dia, I'm from Senegal. I was born in a northern uh, small town called Matam, and this is a town that I go back every time to make my movies. So, I'm very attached to that small town still. So, when I got this email from the last lecture series, there was a typo. So, I read the email, I was like, Oh my God, it's, not, it's not me, so I'm fine. So I ignored the email for a couple of days, or a couple of hours actually. I got another email saying, actually it's you, Mr. Dia, that we're talking about. That's you that we want to do the last lecture service. And I did what I do usually when I get this type of emails, ignore them for a couple of days, <laughs> hoping that they're gonna go away. <laughs> then I had to come back and write to that person and say, Hey, I got this email, sounds like a wonderful news. What do I have to do? And they told me, actually, you're just part of the finalist. We're gonna make another last uh, group of people who are gonna actually present the last lectures. So I was like, phew, I dodged a bullet. <laughs> then, unluckily, a couple of days later, the same gentleman come back again, say, you are part of the last lectures of this year. And what I do when I have uh, public speeches to do, my life becomes before the speech and after the speech. Everything I do is now linked to that speech I have to do. So, because I have this uh, great fear of speaking in public. So tonight, what I want to talk about is my fears that I have in life. So I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to talk about something else that is what we all know as imposter syndrome. How do I feel when I'm in a list where one of the other person used to be the president at the UVA, and another one has created the lose list? <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and the last point I want to talk about is loss and grief. I have lost my mother when I was 13, and as a man, as a, I would say, straight heterosexual man, I always run away from that emotion, and I never dealt with it, until now I'm making a movie about it. So tonight, I will share my vulnerabilities, talk about my fears and weaknesses. 
the idea is how do we grow from something we think is holding us back? How do we live with those fears and weaknesses? So I'm going to speak about public speaking and shyness. As I said, in my small town, I was known always to be that shy kid who didn't talk much. My friends who knew me back at the time still tell me how silent I was. I was working on the streets, always on the side, because I didn't want to be seen or talk to people. But something I had always was a smile. I would always smile back to people, even though I didn't talk to them. It because I felt it was too much energy talking. And I felt also I didn't have anything interesting to say. But what that taught me is I realized that I could read people by sitting there, not being able to talk to them. By sitting there, not being able to engage, I could see emotions on people's faces. I could read those micro expressions. So I knew when my friends were not happy. I knew when some of my friends were not being themselves of the day. And I became this kid who was good at a one-on-one -on -one discussion. I would always bring some of them somewhere and be able to talk to them. So what that gave me was my first job as a writer of letters. What that means is in Senegal, the official language is French. But at home, we always spoke different languages. In mine, it's a language that's called Fulani, that is spoken by millions of people across Africa. So what people would do, they would invite me in the privacy of the rooms or the houses, dictate me in Fulani what they want me to write in letters. So this is pre-mobile phone era. So they would dictate, and that was the first time for me living in a society that was so polished that I've seen adults being vulnerable. That was something I didn't experience as a kid. Now I could see fear in their faces. I could hear some of them sobbing when they were sharing bad news. So I was that kid who could hear and understand what's going on. So that shyness brought me a treasure. And what I learned from that project, because I had no idea, and they also had no idea, that 25 years later, that would be part of a film I, made, I, I would make later. So that shyness brought me into this treasure. So what I learned is, under those fears, are always inspirations that I could go back as a filmmaker. Those fears that I didn't want to deal with, being shy, not being able to talk to people, hating to be in a public space, uh, hating to talk in front of people are things that I have to go through as a human being. And nobody told me when I was making movies that I would have to stand in front of people. That wasn't part of my thinking. What I thought is you do a work with actors, you edit and you share it with the world. So for me, being that kid, talking to people, telling me secrets. For instance, that was the first time I learned what an affair was, because I'm writing for an adult who's writing to her lover that lives in another city. That's something I didn't experience as a kid. When people were telling me why they were sick, why they're longing for a loved one who is far away, those are things that I hit me a lot. So the learning that I had as a shy person kept going. And this helps me today as a filmmaker. How do I relate into emotions? How do you translate an emotion visually? How do I talk to actors? I'm not the type of director who would stand in front of 150 people because sometimes that's what our teams are and that's the job of the first AD. But I'm good at taking an actor somewhere and talking to them. So I'm going to show you a clip from that short film. It's called Sandy Cinema. And Sandy Cinema is basically two friends in northern Senegal who write letters to raise money to go watch a movie. And that movie happened to be Malcolm X. Malcolm X is the first movie I've seen a big screen. And when I say big screen, it's literally a sheet, white sheet, and a projector. A professor of English at that time in my small town brought a projector. That was my first time seeing something that big. Because every time I watched something, it was on a small screen a small TV. Then I realized, oh, there is something making this movie. There is someone thinking about it. Because if you remember very well, the opening credits were 
the American flag burning and becoming an X. As a kid, you always played with fire, right? And I knew there is no way that you can, uh, you can burn something and it becomes an X. And years later, I go to NYU, there was Spike Lee, one of my professors. And I went down the hall and said, my first movie was my comics. And he told me, I can't give you the rights to use clips of the film, but you can use the sound of it. And he gave me one of the posters of the film, of Malcolm X that I used into uh, making the film in Senegal. So let's watch a clip. So this experience, as I, as I said, allowed me to see that even adults were struggling. I thought I was being just having issues as a shy kid, but then I realized even adults have issues, have issues. And now, by writing their letters, and then weeks later, they would read, they would get the answers. I would also read the answers for them. So it created this relationship between this kid I was with these adults. And they trusted me because they knew I wouldn't repeat their secrets. So this relationship went for a long time as I was always writing and reading those letters. Some of them would write to the same person asking for the same thing. So I would, at some days, sit there, start writing before you know, they start dictating. So that's how the relationship was close. So, as I mentioned before, the fear of public speaking. Every time I have to speak in public, most of the time I think that the air is not flowing out my throat, that I cannot speak clearly. Can you hear me? Yeah? And most of the time, if I'm sitting at the, at the round table where people have to speak, when it's almost my turn to do so, I feel this urge of running to the bathroom. But it's always too late. Then when I have to do it, what I found was to speak quick and fast. The downside of it being, people ask you to repeat yourself. So instead of speaking for five minutes, I find myself speaking for 10 or 15. So what I, what I, what I did then was always, when they asked me to repeat, then I 
take so much time and it becomes so much self-conscious of doing that exercise. So it becomes harder, it becomes like this uh, circle. And then later I found out I was sometimes praying at festivals and venues not to have a prize, not to win a prize, because I didn't want to go up there and make a speech. Literally begging not to win anything. So what I found later is what is I, I am what they call a social introvert. It means if you take a hundred people, ten would tell you this guy talks so much, too much. But ninety percent of those people would tell you he doesn't speak enough. I don't even think he likes it because he doesn't talk to me. So it turns out social introvert what they do is the type of people who would go to a party and sit on one chair and talk to the person next to them from the hours that the party lasts. They would make two or three friends and would talk to those friends every single day but not talk to anyone else. So I'm literally that person. After 10 years in the US, I'm still talking to my best friend in Senegal almost daily. So when I found that out, I think, OK, so there is some normalcy of it. Maybe I'm not alone in this situation. But what that allows me, again, is always in my film how to be, how to bring that into talking to people, how to work in small teams. So as I said, after this film, Sunday Cinema, I got that my fears are where my aspiration is. I have to dig deep into the things I didn't want to talk about. I have to dig deep into the memories I didn't want to visit to make my memories. So a person I talk, I spoke a lot when I was younger, or two people were always my sister and my mother. And ask them too many questions all the time. And they would joke and say, are you a journalist? So it's funny that later, that was my job for eight years, covering news all around Africa. And the more silent I was, the more questions I had. So it wasn't I am silent and I'm finding answers, but I'm finding more and more questions. So one thing that I experienced at 13, I did not know those feelings. All I've seen in real life, in movies, in fiction, for adult and grown up men, the main emotions I've seen was anger or happiness. Every movie I've seen, the main actor is either happy or angry. That I've seen people in the most time be in my living, even in literature. I grew up in a place where women in the op in opposite were able to experience a range of emotions that as a young boy I couldn't. So for me, when that happened, I was 13 years old. People knew how to talk to my older siblings because I'm the youngest one. People knew how to speak with them, but they have this unease on how to talk to a 13 years old who just lost their mind. So I didn't know those emotions, what they were, and I didn't know how to deal with them because that was my first time experiencing them. And Due to climate reasons and also religious beliefs, when someone dies in my culture, they are buried very quickly. So I didn't get to see my mother's body. And in a Western understanding of loss, there are phases, some of them the most known are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And each one of these phases can last for years or for weeks. It can be a cycle that you go through over and over again. It can be experienced one for a longer time. The one I did experience a lot was denial. I was going literally into the streets or going to school in my head thinking that I'm going to see my mother and bring her home. But at that time, I didn't know what that was. Until years later, I came into a school therapy. By making this film, writing the script, whenever I sat down, and try to think of that morning I learned the news, I felt all again that emotion I didn't know what it was. So by talking to therapists, one in Senegal and one in the US, they told me I experienced what they call a depressive, a depressive episode when I was a young uh, a teenager. 
So what happened is, I realized even by writing this movie and starting to talk to my family members, because losing a parent is so hard that many families would choose not to talk about that parent ever again. But this time, by researching and writing the script, I decided to talk to every single one of them. And I realized only three years, in the past three years, that I got the date wrong. I added always two years more. According to the therapist, I needed to grow up two years more in one night. And I had no idea. So, what I've seen is that opened up so many questions for me about mental health. In the US, researchers say most people, from the first time they experience any mental health thing, it takes them years before they seek help. And my question is, how would it be in Senegal when in my native language we don't have even a word for depression? So what does it mean in that culture to be a young and has a depression? So that sparked another film I am working on. Because for me, going every morning and every night into writing the script, relieving those emotions were so hard but I had to go through them. The only way I could make that movie was to be honest about my emotions, about what I lived, about what I had to go through. And uh, a brain is a wonderful piece of machinery, but it doesn't see the difference between relieving an experience and leaving it in the first place. So while I'm writing and revisiting those traumatic moments and dealing with them, that was the only way to get the story, by literally dwelling into that story. Talking to people who didn't want to talk about it. My siblings didn't want to talk about it at all. I had to find ways to force them to talk about it. How did they experience it? And what I learned was, we all experience loss in a different way. And they got something I didn't get. They got something because they were older. In therapy, you always talk about your difficult moments. You talk about them over and over and again. Then in my culture, we have something similar. When you are grieving, every person that comes to visit you to, uh, for their condolences, they would ask a question that is a variation of, how did it happen? You would hear that question a lot. And then you have to answer it over and over and over again. But I didn't have to go through that process because of my age. So now, by writing now, I'm going through that process that my siblings had, but I didn't have to. And during the research of my movie, after writing it for years, I realized what were the sentences I wanted to hear, but I never got to hear. And those sentences were so simple. The first one would have been having an adult that I loved and I trusted tell me, your mother won't come back. It was just important for me to hear that. Even though I knew it, I couldn't believe it. And the second sentence would have been, she did not die because she doesn't love you. Because in many cultures, as a kid, you would hear, the loved one who passed is in a better place. So I'm thinking, so she had a choice to pick this place or the other one. So hearing that sentence would have made a big difference for me. The last one would have been a, loved per, a loving person that I know and trust. Tell me, we the members of the family who are here love you as such and we love you forever. And those sentences, when I realized them, I put them in my script. So it was very healing for me to have a scene of a young boy playing my young self, making a movie in my hometown, very close to the house where I was born playing that. That scene might not be in the final edit of the film, but just by seeing it played out, it was very healing for me. Hearing an actor with a deep voice, someone I know who grew up in my small town, tell that to the young kid, felt that somebody was finally recognizing what I wanted to say. And I was only able to find those sentences when or, uh, after I went through that suffering of every day when researching that film. 
and it turns out making a film about your loved one is one of the last stages of grief, what people call make meaning. Make meaning is when you decide to run a marathon because your grandpa loved running, or when you decide to cycle to make a tour because your cousin who passed loved doing it. So that process also was only possible by dwelling into those fears. So tonight I'm going to show you a clip of the film. It's still in editing. You are one of the lucky ones to see this. So sorry about that it's not color corrected yet and the sound needs to work, but I think we can enjoy it. loss became a different story. So I have some students who I work here and we always talk about writing scripts. How to have something that is so dear to you and how do you express that to other people. Because in filmmaking it's really only filmmaking is talking about your experiences but you're sharing them with other people. So that experience I had with a kid while writing the script, I'm thinking what's the best way to tell that story. It became a man who is about to retire and he has lost his wife. And this man, as we can see, he doesn't have many friends. The only person he could al always lean to was his late wife. And then by talking about grief and researching this, the thing that people would do most whenever you talk about 
mental health, you talk about loss, they would most of the time tell, show you a picture. So this whole scene of a picture doesn't exist in this tradition, in this culture. It was a pure creation where two people who lost loved ones are meeting on a beach and they are burning whatever it was left and they don't want to hold on to. So this is what the scene became. So Demba is still in post-production and hopefully it will be done in the next summer. So the lesson I learned from that experience when I wasn't involved of the healing process, I got a back seat and I saw how my society was working. So from the big that kids who sat always in recess in a corner watching other kids, now I was that kid who sat during funeral and processing times and saw also adult people how they worked with. And talking about vulnerability, here I'm again speaking next to a UVA president and the creative rules list. So it always bugs my mind that what I'm doing here. So a purchase syndrome is a real thing that in film happens all the time. Whenever I got a prize, whenever I got like the Guggenheim Fellowship last month, I'm going through the list of all the winners. I'm like, am I supposed to be here? And then I remember the more I talk to people I look up to, people I know, they always tell me, this is a feeling also they have. You become a president, you become a full professor. Before being a full professor, you weren't a full professor. So that feeling is a feeling also of belonging. You are trying new territories, so that's why you're going to feel that all the time. So. Now being here in Charlottesville, in academia, my imposter syndrome also came again when I was offered a job of teaching. Because most of my experiences teaching was some teachers would think, they are right, the other people are wrong. This is my theory. It's the right one. The other researchers might be wrong. How could I apply that into filmmaking? How can you right or wrong when in film you only sharing your experience. The movies each one of you would make would have nothing to do with the movies I would make. Because when they come from our personal experiences and emotions, no one can write a film for another person. So I kept asking myself, how can I do that? And I think one of the ways was allowing people to try and fail the way I allow myself to try and fail. I would shoot many scenes that nobody would see. I would watch them and know how bad they are and recognize that that's the end of it. So in class, when students go to shoot, I don't ask them to bring a perfect scene. I don't ask them to have a perfect script because the idea is in the learning process, you're going to fail and learn from your failures. So it turns out also from that imposter syndrome is something that many first generation college students would share because the more you get, the more you think of yourself, the more you doubt yourself in some ways. And in this world of academics here, I find also the courage of going beyond my comfort zone always. And now I'm working on a project about Augustus Washington. This project is beyond anything I've done before. Just the research is going to take years and a team of people working on it. We know this photographer existed at the end of the 19th century in West Africa. He was part of those black folks who said, the American promise of freedom doesn't work for us. We're going to create a new country that's now Liberia in West Africa. Then he started touring against the co around the coast taking pictures of people. And what is beautiful about his story, he, no one knows his face. We know his name. He photographed John Brown, who lived in Virginia, who was the first American to be hanged for treason because he was an anti esclavagist <clears throat> So that film would be also going out of my comfort zone, feeling that fear, and knowing that fear is going to be there, feeling to uh, fear of failing, and fears of succeeding. 
when I'm in my position, my fears, success is more fearful than even falling. Because when you don't make a movie, nobody would notice. When your movie doesn't happen, life would go on. But when it happens and then you have to be again on the spotlight, that's what I dread the most. Then when I think about all these fears and problems, I can say, I wish sometimes when I was 13, there was someone with a spreadsheet or with a machine who could tell me, as a social introvert, this is the jobs you could do. Because I feel sometimes I'm, a wrong, I'm in the wrong lines of jobs. I'm standing before people, talking to students, talking to crowds in film festivals. Then that would have allowed me probably to be sometimes a librarian or an accountant or maybe a software engineer. But now here I'm doing something that I feel always is very hard to do. So those people would have, in my mind, a filmmaker, someone would come after them end of elementary school and say, based on your personality, not on your grades, this is what you should do. But then if I did that, I wouldn't have the chance to be who I am today, making movies. Because in creating and sharing things and stories that I have no idea how they will land and how people would deal with them, this is something magical. Sharing a film on a festival, having someone shake your hand in tears, telling you how you touch them, this priceless. Because what we create, we create them always to share them with other people. And those fears now, I know they won't go away. I would always be scared of speaking in public. I will always be scared and shy to go to talk to people. I would always have to deal with this loss of a mother years ago that I haven't dealt with in real life. I would always have to go through those. But I'm now embracing being vulnerable. I'm embracing this process. When I make movies, from the writing to the shooting to the promotion, it takes between five to six years. And during those five or six years, I'm doubting myself every single day. And what I realize is this is part of the process. The more you doubt, the more you create. When you get to that point where you are certain that you're doing is beautiful, and I think that's a problem. So, and I think filmmakers want to make money. They want to be successful. People want to recognize them on the street. But as filmmakers, we have the power to be brutally honest. This honesty that I can find in my films and my fears allow me to share things that are deep down real for me. And that honesty is for me being vulnerable. And only by being vulnerable, I could feel that I could heal from the problems I've experienced as a person. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. One more round of applause. Thank you for coming and thank you, Professor Drame and Daya. Thank you to the students and all of you. It's always nice seeing people. Thank you so much. <laughs>